the Big Ten title, a couple of upsets, and some legends back in town, the Terps have been busy here in College Park. Welcome back. I'm Alex Flom. And I'm Danielle Stein. We've got all that and much more on this episode of TLB TV. It's been 15 years since the Maryland men's basketball team won the national title. They hadn't been all together since their trip to the White House. That changed with the reunion at the Xfinity Center before Maryland faced Iowa. Members of the 2001 Final Four and 2002 national title teams caught up with each other and spoke to fans. I have a lot of the guys I haven't seen for many, many years, and especially we haven't been in the same room together. Uh, lots of change in our lives, but as we get together, a lot of things are the same. You know, we're, we just try to make each other laugh and, and, and uh, tell stories, and it's, uh, it's special. I'm thankful that the university is doing this for us. Maybe this year's Maryland team can get some inspiration from the 2002 squad. The current Terps are reeling three losses in a row for them for the first time since Mark Turgeon began coaching the team. And they've fallen out of the top 25. Max Marcillo was at the Terps' most recent game for TLB TV. Taking on Iowa Saturday and it was flash mob night for the Terps, but outside of that, not much for Maryland fans to cheer about. Peter Jock getting things started with the triple, the first of 16 threes for the Hawkeyes. Jordan Bohannon had night, he was 8 of 10 from downtown. Herter led the Terps with 13 points and one spectacular jam. But Herter's dunk didn't do too much for Maryland. 22 Iowa points off turnovers. Terps dropped their third in a row. But we've just been so tough, and for some reason the last few games we haven't been. So hopefully between now and Tuesday night, we become a tough team again. We figure out how when the going gets tough, we stay confident. I still think we're a hungry team. You know, we were just talking in the locker room, and we had leaders like Melo and Jared and Dion all telling us they went through a similar streak like this when they were freshmen. We now have basketball analyst Liam Bedis on the show to talk about Maryland's recent struggles. What's caused this losing streak to happen? I definitely think defensively they're a step behind, and because of that, that's affecting their confidence. I think defensively they've always been strong, and they've always played a very good man-to-man, -man, and that's allowed them to stay in games when they've um, struggled to shoot from beyond the arc. And I think their defense has started to take a step back, and because of that, I think they're a little shaken confidence-wise. So two regular season games left. We have Rutgers on the road and then Michigan State at home. What can the Terps do to turn this around? I think if they just get back to the roots, you know, this team used to not be afraid of playing behind in games. They enjoy the adversity uh, of starting off halftime and coming from behind and winning games. I just think all it needs is a switch. I think one good half, maybe one good eight or nine minute stretch where they're hitting baskets and the defense is allowing the offense to get good looks. And that's all this team needs because we've seen them play well before. They're just young and they've, they've hit a roadblock. Now you look ahead to the next game, Rutgers coming up. Rutgers obviously not one of the top teams in the Big Ten, but if Maryland is to fall in that game and then let's say they lose to Michigan State also and let's say they lose in the Big Ten tournament losing out, do they still make the tournament in the NCAA tournament? Are they on the bubble? What, what's the scenario there? Well, I think at 22 wins in a Power 5 conference, they're right now, I would say, a lock to at least make the tournament. My worry is they're playing in one of those four play-in games against a team that got really hot, maybe a team like a Syracuse who plays a tough 2-3 zone, one of those tough Power 5 conferences who have played against tougher schedules that maybe just squeaked their way in, and a team that's playing really well could take advantage of a Maryland team who, if they would, were to lose out, would be reeling, and their confidence would be at an all-time low. That's my biggest fear. I think they will certainly make it into the tournament. Well, there certainly is more basketball left, so we look forward to both your coverage and seeing how the Terps do the rest of the season. So thank you very much for being here. No, thank you. <laughs> One word you could use to describe the careers of Brianna Jones and Shatori Walker Kimbrough is dominant. The dynamic duo helped lead the women's basketball team to a pair of Final Fours and won a number of individual honors. On Sunday, they were recognized for Senior Day. Back to back to back. Big Ten champs. Well, you gotta love it, you gotta love it when it goes uh, when the script plays out. Nothing new for seniors Brianna Jones and Jatori Walker Kimbrough. As Terps, the duo has won 120 games and made two Final Four appearances. They were honored on Sunday for Senior Day as their banners were lowered in the Xfinity Center. Just looking up there, this makes me feel emotion. I don't even know how to put it into words, but I just I'm completely honored. You're, I'm named amongst 
Christy Tolliver, Marissa Coleman, like legends that have played here. I would have never guessed that one day that I would be named amongst those. I mean, it's, it's completely an honor. Coach Freeze showed great pride for the record-breaking Jones and Walker Kimbrough. The pair has collected some impressive honors throughout their time in College Park. Walker Kimbrough setting a Big Ten record in three-point percentage and Jones leading the country in field goal percentage for the second year in a row. Your loyalty while the turnovers, air ball, mislay, and foul shots was unmatched. And I thank you for that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to play for any other fans in the country. Go Terps! What well, was certainly an emotional day for those two. Well, for the Terps, they may have two seniors, but they say good things come in threes. And for Brenda Freeze's team, that rings true. This is now the third year in a row that the Terps have won at least a share of the regular season Big Ten title. TLB TV's Alicia Sharon was there as Maryland top Minnesota and hoisted the trophy. Another day, another Big Ten championship. I'm Alicia Cherim here with Connor Newcomb for the Left Bench TV Overtime, where the Maryland Terrapins just defeated the Minnesota Gophers 93-60. to Let's take a look at the highlights. Terps took the lead early on, starting off with a smooth three-pointer by Walker Kimbrough. Drive to the basket by Slocum and a quick layup by Brianna Jones. Brianna Frazier with the block. Walker Kimbrough takes it down and goes up for an easy layup. A steal from freshman Destiny Slocum takes it all the way down the court, stops, connects, and makes the three. Some quick passes and Comfrey goes up for an easy layup. Some senior to senior action, Walker Kimbrough passes to Jones, goes in for the layup and one. One last steal and the final point of the game came from freshman Jenna Stady, helping the Terps secure their third Big Ten championship in a row. We're just so proud, you know, I, I can't say enough about the girls and all the hard work they put in uh, behind the scenes this past summer uh, to be able to, to win a regular season. It just speaks volumes of their consistency level and all their hard work. What are you expecting from the Terps moving on to postseason? Yeah, going into the Big Ten tournament this weekend, if all goes right for both teams, it'll look like it could be a rematch of Maryland and Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game where the Terps will look to get revenge and prove themselves to the NCAA tournament committee. Well, Danielle, March Madness just around the corner. Both Maryland basketball teams gearing up for the postseason. We have both Maryland basketball teams and both of our Jareds on TLB TV on this week's edition of Jared vs. Jared. Thanks, guys. All right, Goldstein, we've got a lot of basketball to talk about. Let's start it off with the women. Two losses this season, but where do you see them being seated when it's all said and done? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I really don't see any reason they shouldn't be a one seed. I know there are some projections that show them on the two line. Um, to be honest with you, anything lower than a one with two losses on the season, one being to UConn and one being to the, one of the other uh, best teams in Ohio State in the conference and in the country, I don't see any reason why they should be any lower than a one. What do you think? See, I, I tend to agree with you, but at the same time, I could see them being a two seed just because of the quality of teams they've played. I feel like a lot of people are fixating on the fact that they lost to UConn by single digits, and for that reason, they should get that number one seed. I mean, I think the wins are really the well, reason. The wins are know? good. Yeah. I agree with that. But, but I mean, you got to win, you got a quality loss, and arguably another quality loss to Ohio State. You know, I don't think there's any reason, you know, why they shouldn't be a one. But anyway, to the men. Men, we could argue about their seeds as well. Uh, they've struggled a bit lately. Uh, they've probably fallen a few seeds since the last time we were on. So, you know, where do you think they end up right now? Honestly, if the tournament were to start today, I think Maryland would be anywhere from an eight to a nine. I just think that they've fallen that far. And what's hurt Maryland is that those wins that we thought were really quality wins, like Indiana, Northwestern. I mean, we've seen what's happened to Indiana. They are not good at all this season. Northwestern, ever since Maryland went to Chicago and beat them, I mean, it's been a free fall for the Wildcats. Even losses to Wisconsin. Wisconsin looks like they're off the rails right now. The Big Ten as a whole just doesn't look great, and I think that's going to hurt Maryland. I I'd put them probably one line higher than you. I'd probably say 7-8 instead of an 8 or a 9. Okay. Um, but to be honest with you, I don't think it's going to, their seed won't matter come tournament time if 
they can't find a consistent way to put the ball in the basket. Uh, it can't be the mellow Trimble show for 40 minutes and you know losing a guy like Tchaikovsky really hurt because now Dodd is the only center and guys like Gill and Bender and Jackson can't give you consistent minutes at the five. Uh, so that leaves guys like Herter and Cowan uh, to, you know, to step up as, as freshmen and you know that's tough to, to ask of freshmen you know, in their first season in college. So I'd be surprised if this team advanced as far as last year's team did. All right, so let's move on to our final question here. Anyway, Maryland doesn't make the tournament. What's their path to the dance? I think they're a lock at this point. I think you know they've they've done enough at this point to secure a spot in the tournament. And you know if they somehow didn't make it, some really bad things would have to happen. Yeah, I I agree. I think that they're a lock at this point. Even if they were to lose every game left on their schedule, they're 22 and 10. So I think Maryland's as close to a lock as it gets at this point. That's going to wrap up our coverage here, Jared and Jared for TLB TV. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, guys. Now on to lacrosse, specifically the women's team. Revenge nine months in the making and another exciting chapter of the Maryland-North Carolina women's lacrosse rivalry. Jared Bellman was at the game and he's got the recap. Yeah, we keep him busy over here. Maryland and North Carolina from Capital One Field. National championship rematch, one of the greatest rivalries in college lacrosse. Weather delayed this game for about two hours, but it only took the Terps 31 seconds to get into this one. Seven minutes later, Jen Giles off the free position, one of her three goals in the game. Maryland goes into the break up 8-5. to five. Pick it up in the second half, Caroline Wannan puts it in the back of the net. Later in the half, Wannan again, this time on the assist. Zoe Stukenberg finishes the play. Terps get revenge on North Carolina and beat the Tar Heels 13 to 10. Um, you know, it, the weather is what it is, something you can't control. And so both teams are kind of held just stuck here waiting and sitting around and it's never easy. It's not easy for anyone, um, you know, but we're just, we're excited to play. It's our first game in this stadium in a really long time and um, just cool environment. There are a ton of fans here tonight, a lot of energy in the stadium, which is nice to see. So we have the game day coverage from Jared Bellman. Now we bring Max Marcilla onto the set for some analysis. So Max, huge win for the Terps, um, now taking over the number one spot in the polls. What did it mean for them to get this win, not just against the number, the number one team then, but against UNC? Well, of course it was a big win. I mean, that's the team that beat the Terps in the national championship. It's always nice to get that revenge and, and get a big win under your belt. But I think what's more impressive than to win is how the Terps did it. If you remember against Georgetown, Maryland built up a big lead and Georgetown slowly crept back and although the Hoyas never took the lead, Maryland was looked a little vulnerable. But against UNC, they built a 3-0 lead and led by at least three the entire game. It was a really impressive showing. And with some graduating seniors last year, the Terps lost big names, obviously. Um, now this is a pretty new look team. Jen Giles was, for example, someone who stepped up in this game. Who else should we expect to be stepping up in these big roles this season? Well, Megan Whittle, Caroline Wannan, a couple other Terps scored multiple goals in the last couple of games. This is a really balanced offense. You put the ball in anyone's stick and anyone can find the back of the net. That's what makes this team special. And it sure is an exciting time to be covering women's lacrosse, and we look forward to seeing the rest of yours and left benches coverage for this season. The rain didn't stop the women's team from taking the field and picking up a victory over the weekend, and it didn't stop the men's team either. After a rain delay of nearly two hours, the Terps hung on for the win. TLB TV's Christina Johnson has the highlights. What started as the perfect sunny day for a game soon turned into battle in the rain between the Terps and the Bulldogs. But with three goals by Heacock and two by Rambo, the Terps battled through. Dan Morris protected the net with 11 saves. Hennessing and Burhardt also each picked up two goals. The Terps took a four-point lead in the second half, only to increase this to a six-point lead mid-third quarter. But Yale wasn't finished and scored six in the third to bring the lead down to two. A rain delay halted the Bulldogs' momentum, and the Terps came out with a 12-11 win. So Christina, you were out in the rain on Saturday, but now joining us here on the set to talk about the men's lacrosse team. How was that dealing with the thunderstorms? It was definitely a long day. I was there for about five hours, but it ended up being a great game, so it was awesome. And then, you know, having that rain delay, nearly two hours that these players had to sit and wait just to get back on the field, how did that affect them? 
it definitely affected the momentum of the game. In the third quarter, Yale went in and scored th six goals to get themselves back into the game. But then in the fourth, they went in and they scored in one. But then the rain delay then pretty much ended everyone's momentum, and Maryland ended up just running the clock and ended with the victory. All right, well, thanks, Christina. Make sure to keep up with her coverage and the rest of the coverage of the men's lacrosse team from the left bench. At 2-11-1 and and one on the season, you look at the Maryland softball team's record and think there's not much to cheer about. But you would be wrong. Saturday, February 18th, Terps up to one out to go. Sammy Main gets the grounder, tosses it to Jordan Augenbaugh at first, and the celebration begins. The Terps upset the then number one ranked Florida Gators 4-2. to two. I think this is going to take us in a great new direction. You know, this win is going to vault us to, to moving forward and really understanding all we need to do is do our piece, do us, and that will be enough to put us in every game to have the opportunity to win. Kevin Brown, one of the softball reporters for the left bench, is here to talk about the crazy upset we saw. So, Kevin, what does this win mean for the Terps? Well, it's been tough times for Maryland softball in recent years, especially this season, coming into the game 0-8, half their games losing by the run rule, the mercy rule, and a Florida team that hasn't lost at home since 2007, no one would have thought they could upset them. But there you have it, their heart, and they did it. The Terps were pretty excited after that win. Looking back at the game itself, which you know one or two players really elevated them to that victory? Well, definitely senior Madison Martin. <clears throat> she, um, she had three hits, and she came into relief, Hannah Dewey, into the center, center circle, to pitch home a great win, and she's been doing it all season for sure. Well, thank you for coming on, Kevin, and we look forward to seeing more of your coverage this season. Thanks for having me. Now, we know Marilyn has some pretty talented athletes, but one of these athletes is taking her talents off the track and into the world of business with some pretty tasty treats. TLB TV reporter Brandon Wong has the inside look. On the Maryland track and field team, Alexandra Semino is a do-it-all athlete. I run the 400 hurdles and the 4 by 4 and relays. Off the track, she's a young entrepreneur busy with their latest product, Frodo. I shouldn't have. Frodo, frozen donuts. At the end of the week, running for Maryland track and field can have you beat. <laughs> but for Al, here at the co-op, every Sunday is a treat. <laughs> Samino first heard the idea from her friend and business partner, Simon. He was house-sitting his neighbor's house, snooping around in their freezer, and found some donuts that they put in the freezer. And he took a bite of it, and he was like, this texture and this mouthfeel is like really interesting. Like, I could totally you know, recreate this and make this some kind of dessert for people. Owner and worker at the Maryland Food Co-op, Chris Molson, said Frodo has been one of the most successful student-run businesses he has partnered with. We've worked with other student businesses in the past, and there's always been pleasant interactions, but it was really different working with Simon and the others uh, because they have a vision of both responsible sort of enterprise and also one that's it's exciting and hip. Samino's team and coaches are excited for her success at Frodo. Future plans, I mean, we'd love to, you know, open up the freezer in Whole Foods and see Frodo's there. That'd be super cool, but the future is frozen. <laughs> with the Left Edge TV, I'm Brandon Wong. All right, so Brandon, welcome on the set. I, I gotta say, I'm pretty upset you didn't bring me a donut. How, how were they? <laughs> Sweet, they were really delicious. I got to try all three flavors, blueberry, s'mores, and banana nut. I'll definitely go about back to the co-op and buy some more. Yeah, I definitely have to get my fix of those photos as well. But now, let's move on to track. So this weekend, we saw the indoor championships. How did the Terps do? So the Terps headed really well at the Big Ten indoor championships. A pair of Terps got second place, Misha Powell in the 400 meters, and Peyton Wade in the pentathlon. So the Terps also did well in the 4 by 400 getting third place and beating a new score record. Overall, the Terps finished with 19 points higher than last year's Big Ten indoors. Now Big Ten indoors over with looking towards the NCAAs. Who on this team can we expect to qualify for them and what can we expect to see from them in that tournament? Well, of course, the previous name mentioned like Misha Pal uh, and Wade, but also Delissa Huggins, a freshman, finished third in the pent pentathlon. So let's see if we can see more Terrapins on the podium at the NCAA indoors. Well, thank you, Brandon. Plenty of stuff to look forward to with uh, Maryland track and field going forward. Let's do a quick check on Maryland tennis. Things are looking up on the court. 6-0 start to the season. 42nd ranked Terps now have matched their best start in program history. Maryland gymnastics currently sits at 500, 11 wins, 11 losses. 
The team will duel with four teams at the Maryland Five meet on Wednesday. From the mats to the diamond, it's been a rough start to the season for the Maryland baseball team. They have just one win through six games, and they were swept by LSU this past weekend. I'm Austin Kleber, TLB's baseball beat reporter on the show. So, Austin, it seems like the team is really missing the arm of Mike Schwarin. Yeah, they've got some experienced guys, but they're struggling. They have junior Taylor Bloom, who's got a 14:40 ERA against LSU on Saturday. He allowed uh, five runs in two innings, but they also have Tyler Blome, who's a freshman, He's got a 5.07 ERA. He's struggling a little bit too. But the one bright spot they do have in their starting lineup or their starting uh, rotation is Brian Schaefer, who's got a 3.09 ERA, a 112 WHIP, and he's got 12 Ks and 11 innings pitch. So he's looking good. They've got a good guy in the bullpen, Andrew Miller. He's had three appearances, only one hit allowed. I think that the the pitching will come eventually. Right now, they just gotta get it together and get it moving. So we talk about the pitchers. Now let's move over to the hitters. Kevin Smith, the shortstop, you know, he was expected to be the star this season for the team, and it seems like in the early going he's been struggling a bit. Yeah, Kevin Smith's been struggling a little bit. He's only got three hits and 23 at-bats, 11 strikeouts. But in his struggles, Marty Costas and Brandon Gum have really been stepping up. They both have an on-base percentage of over 500. Marty Costas is batting 423. These two guys are guys that we can expect to keep carrying the load for the rest of the season because they've been playing very well against number four in the country, LSU, and number nine, Louisville. If they keep this up against Big Ten play, we could see the Terps go into the NCAA tournament and maybe do well. But for right now, they are in a trial period, and we just got to see what they can do. More baseball coming up. We have spring just around the corner. It's been beautiful weather around, perfect for baseball. Mm -hmm. I've been playing catch a lot. That's great. And that's all we have for this week's episode of The Left Bench TV. For now, I'm Danielle Stein. And I'm Alex Flo. Make sure to follow The Left Bench on Twitter and keep up with our coverage on all sports.